if you give a mouse a cookie. We all know that story and that lesson, but alas, sometimes we have to learn that lesson more than once. <sighs> Originally, we were supposed to tile, you know, just around the fireplace to give it that classic fireplace look, you know? But uh, alas, if you give a mouse a cookie, she'll have you tile the whole thing. But when that happens, what can you do but say, challenge accepted. I'm Pat, this is Nesbo Design Co. And today, I'm gonna show you how I took this tile and turned it into this fireplace. Let's get to work. First things first is the tile backer. So this is some cement board from the Home Depot. That's what you wanna use for any kind of tile work uh, because it's got a nice rough surface so that mortar will really bind. Here I'm just cutting it with a regular old surgery saw and a regular old blade. Uh, yeah, it's gonna ruin my blade, but it's still cheaper than buying one of those fancy ones. So once you get it all cut, you get that bad boy installed, but just make sure you're using the proper screws. If you work alone a lot, you gotta find lots of ways to work smart. So here I just grabbed some scrap and used it as a little shelf to set my board as I struggle to find my driver. But once I got the bottom locked in, wanted to get the top lined up, the easy way to do that is just jam in a handy shim, because boy, they're handy. Moving on to rocking around the fireplace. So I like to make life easy, so I grabbed some scrap to have a reference surface, and then just wedge that bottom sheet in there with some handy shims and lock it down. Here I worked from the bottom to the top as I was rocking to make life easy, so that way when I got to that top sheet, I had something to set it on. So two quick things to notice here is one, you don't want to ever wedge it up against the ceiling so you can shave it down, but two, I actually did mark out my studs ahead of time, so actually once I set the rock, I had marks so I knew exactly where my studs were, so I could come back, snap a line, and easily know where to line up my screws. Another quick thing to note here is actually when I framed up this fireplace, I deliberately built it so it was actually be one sheet wide in the front. I actually took the sides into account too, so then I could just slap it up there, throw on my screws, and be done. Pro tip from a real pro, Transfer your marks over to the wall if you know you're gonna cover them up while doing your tile work. Next up is installing the TV back box. So this little outlet recessed kit came with a template that made it nice and easy. But one thing I did is I actually drill through the backside to the front to make sure that I was actually gonna line up with the blocking where I needed to be. Then I came back, drew out the corners, cut it all out with my oscillating multi-tool, punched it out, bing, bing, boom, got it done. Once I got it all cut out, then I did install the recess box. Then I traced it out so when I come back to do the tile later, I can run my tile right up to the line and have a perfect recess later. It seemed like a good idea at the time. So I thought I was gonna be smart for my floating shelves later and install these little shelf brackets and tile around it, but you'll see later that didn't really work out because I uh, can't cut that tile that thin. Time to mix some mortar because you know that's kind of a key component of doing tile work. Uh, here, nothing over complicated, just make sure you get a mortar that actually is suited to your type of tile. Here I used large format mortar for my large tiles. Just follow the directions on the bag and I want it to look like peanut butter. That's about it. So now we got all the mortar mixed and it's time to cut some tile. So here I was cutting the end and I wanted to actually get that rough edge because I'd read a whole lot of bad reviews about those preformed corners just never being 90, never turning out good. So I decided, hey, I'll make my own. Turns out that uh, doing it that way is extremely time consuming and kind of a pain in the butt, but it all worked out. Another thing I did here though, you'll notice, is that I made a nice little ledger board. Took a little piece of plywood, screwed at the bottom side of that fireplace. So I actually had something to set all these tiles on as I went up. Clean up, clean up, everybody everywhere. But seriously though, if you're gonna actually do these tiles and you're actually doing it in portions and not gonna set all this at once and have a whole team with you, you actually wanna scrape it out in between if you're doing this kind of woven pattern because if that hardens up in there, it's not gonna make your tiles go together and that's gonna be a bad day. Another thing you'll notice though is that I have a nice little ledger strip on the side too. Right on my countertop's gonna perfectly slide in later. So you should always transfer any of your marks that you're gonna cover up with tile over to a wall in case you need to bring it back later because none of this actually worked out. After cutting enough tile, I realized there was no way I was gonna be able to cut it thin enough around those guys, so I just took them all down. Frickin' laser beams. When I'm not on the head of a shark, they're actually extremely helpful on like my tile saw. 
pro tile tip here. So when you're actually drawing out your mortar lines here, you wanna make sure that however you're doing it, vertical, horizontal, you just wanna make sure they're parallel. Cause that allows it when you gotta push it in there to collapse those ribs, you actually make sure that any air can escape. And as someone who's punched a whole lot of apartments and had to rip out whole areas of tile because they sounded hollow or didn't have a good bond, you wanna do it right the first time. So you might have noticed that I actually took that giant piece of black plywood down that was going to be for my TV mounting, but I actually took it down because I wasn't going to be able to cut good thin tiles around it. So I just said, nah, scrap it. So now we're cutting some tile around some things. So here I'm just using the full tile to actually measure out from the other side so I can set a full tile there later. And then actually setting that in place and marking out my lines there so I know where to cut. Take that bad boy over to the saw and get to cutting. So one kind of different thing you'll notice me doing is I'm actually cutting from both sides and kind of easing up on that cut because uh well experience has taught me with this tile it actually will snap off really easily so I wanted to try and minimize my overcut so I actually slowly nipped away at it from both sides and this gave me that nice perfect cut I was looking for satisfaction so now I'll go in a little more into depth about how I got that woven edge look I mean, first step is obviously cutting a tile down to size on one end, but then actually go up there and do my markings, do my layout. So the arrow shows which side I wanna run past. X is the side that stops. Then I take a piece of scrap tile and mark it out for where I wanna set my scoring mark. Then I'll take it over my saw and actually score it. You notice the blade's not all the way down, and if you need to, eh, rock it up a little, get a little bit better for score so you can knock it off and get that nice, rough, natural looking edge. And then to sneak up on the other cut, I cut from the back side and just slowly get that perfect cut. So one thing you wanna do if you're doing this stack stone, you actually wanna make sure you file that out. Cause if you don't, it's gonna slowly add up and your corners are gonna end up out of square. Once you do the first side, all you gotta do is repeat it for the other side and boom, perfect. And one little note, as you get towards your ceiling or towards your wall, you wanna make sure you leave a little bit of gap that you can caulk with some sand to caulk later. So here's a little bit of a uh, cowboy move that I picked up trying to cut some super slim tiles to go right up against the ceiling and down below the fireplace. What I did is I actually took my blade because you could raise it up and then slowly drop it into the piece and then started my cut because those tiles were so long. It's a little bit sketchy, but it actually worked out really well and got me some nice, perfectly straight pieces. Note there is a bigger tile saw that would actually be a little better suited for this, but this fit my budget and got the job done. Now I'm just mixing some more mortar and that is extremely mesmerizing. And I did this a lot because you wanna work in small batches when you're doing this, cause this stuff will set up on you. And you don't want that. Oh, peanut butter. That's what you want right there. Now remember to clean your tool cause everyone appreciates a clean tool, if you know what I'm saying. So now we're moving back down below where the fireplace is gonna be. Here you notice I actually took my time and planned out a few pieces ahead. So I gave myself a nice good lead on tiles cut. And another thing that I did do is I put some spacers down below and not just some handy shims to get it off the floor, but also some three quarter inch plywood so I could actually plan for the wood flooring that I know my wife is gonna ask for later because you know, if you give a mouse a cookie. So one thing to note about using a more natural stone tile, well, sometimes that means they can have some natural fissures built in. So uh, sometimes things, well, well, they just don't, uh, they don't go as planned. But when life gives you lemons, you just make lemonade. So fortunately, I actually was gonna need a whole lot of little pieces for piecing in around the fireplace. So I just saved all these broken pieces and cut them up and used a blader. But this is a good time to note that if you're ever buying a lot of material for a project, you wanna make sure you buy extra. I probably bought about two or three extra boxes of tile and I used pretty much every last bit of it. And now we're on to piecing in around the fireplace using all these little broken off pieces. They're actually perfect for cutting down to size to making this, well, big boy puzzle. And once you got all your little pieces cut, it's time to slap them in place. Here, I'm not really worried about working out those trial lines. I just kind of mud the crap out of it and stick them in place. For pieces this small, you're not really worried about trapping air bubbles, but uh, maybe if you are, well, I don't know any better. And sometimes I didn't always cut them perfect, so I had to go back and cut them, but I got it down to a science at this point. And for these little odd sections around the cutout where I plan my cabinets to go, well, this is why you save your scraps. Now you might be wondering why I had some of these little odd cuts. Well, that vertical bar there was actually for where my cabinets are gonna go later. So instead of trying to scribe to the stone later, I actually made it where I can remove that bar and just slide in a perfect straight cut piece later and make my life easy. 
because as the saying goes, proper planning prevents... Gosh, I forget. Well, if you made it this far, thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you for watching, and I hope you learned something. If you want to stay tuned, my next video will be how I made these floating shelves and hung up all this other crap to finish this never-ending build. So until next time, cheers.